These masterclasses, in fact, the whole series uh, has been interwoven with what are essentially now uh, single, double and group coachings to get repertoire off the ground for the semester that's both post produced and uh, live Zoom recordings. There are some pieces that lend themselves very well to a Jam Kazam or a Jamulus fee. On those uh, of you joining us from the Jazz Department already know that because you're only doing Jam Kazam. Um, but in order to function in all of those places, the kinds of things that Professor Morelli is addressing over the course of these master classes are key skills that make functioning as an individual musician, whether it's you and 70 other people on a stage, or whether it's you and your USB microphone, whatever, and truly anything in between. Um, these are foundational skills. And I, I don't want you to mistake the word foundational for either easy or small. Uh, these, these skills, when spun out, are some of the most complex things you will do as musicians. And if you get a good solid start on them, that's the only reason to call them foundational, because you build on them every time you take out your instrument, every time you sing, every time you rosin up a bow and go into a coaching. Um, they are, they're, they're special too in that it's, it would be one thing if we were all sitting in Lefrac or in the rehearsal hall in sort of a master class situation. The advantage here, and I, I did a, boatload of this during my doctorate. The advantage here is you are actually getting to sit in what is essentially a private broadcast. Uh, Frank Morelli is going to talk to you. Right now I am talking to you. Yes, there are, there are upwards of 35 other people on your Zoom screen, almost 40. But the, the immediacy and the intimacy of someone speaking to you about a skill, about your instrument, and especially about the context that that lives in is really a gift. And I've been thinking about that during this COVID tide. What other situation could we be in as musicians where you're getting outside feedback, you're getting outside coaching, but the only thing in the room with you is the sound you're making? That's a gold mine of feedback. So just wanted to plant those couple of seeds as I introduce a bassoonist who I have known about since I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, because when I flipped over the Deutsche Grammophon CD and looked at the name roster of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, I got to see a clarinet player that I knew lots about, and I got to see a violinist that I knew lots about, Who's this Frank Morelli guy? Holy crap, can he play? And I've been saying that since 1988. So it is a, a joy to be able to uh, introduce someone, I, and I can't believe I can say this because we're on the same faculty now, my colleague, Frank Morelli. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for those kind words, but also I really appreciate the introduction. I could not agree more with the way you were framing the situation, the fact that while you said these are foundational concepts, they are crucial and essential building blocks to your musicianship, to your ability to control your instrument and to play in ensembles. And, and in fact, while they are foundational and um, which is it's a really great word for it the foundation uh 
they are things that I still think about and practice after all these years. They are not things that you check off the list, got through, you know, math class this or theory class that. In fact, with theory, you build on it for the rest of your life. If you don't, uh, and that's like with languages too. And I learned with math when I was in high school and realized I was better off in music than in engineering. If you don't keep following and getting, once you hit calculus, if you don't have it together, man, you're dead. So it's the same thing with this. It all starts with the sound. It all starts with breathing. Now, I also hoped, and I'm not sure who's here, but we're also recording these classes on the product of the music ed system. I come from Massapequa, Long Island. I was a sax player, and in high school they needed a bassoon player in the band. My parents were factory workers. They said, the bassoon? What's that, Frankie? You know, and I brought home this old dusty instrument, and that changed in essence through a period of remar a, a, a series of remarkable circumstances. I ended up doing what I'm doing today. So as far as I'm concerned, music education is essential, not to produce pro professional musicians, but as an enrichment in our lives. I'm preaching to the choir because you all love music. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. And I also hope that um, music ed uh, majors who are not wind players, as well as wind players, would watch this, would hear this, and take, please steal all these ideas to use in your own teaching. And of course, as the my wonderful Woodwind Rep class, and I see my, my uh, loyal subjects here in this class today, that, um, that these concepts are what I teach on the highest level to our really excellent advanced players, to more basic students. It is the way to play your instrument. All right, so we'll get right to work. I'm going to now Put, I'm going to share the screen and put up, I made a slideshow. We'll find out about that, won't we? But, uh, I mean, a PowerPoint, I should say. It's not really a slideshow. Here I am in front of the Taj Mahal. That would be a slideshow, I guess, right? But um, let me do this in probably the least efficient way, but I'm going to get it up for the, here it comes. Okay, so the whole idea of this, right? Concepts and pedagogy, breathing, tone, production, and articulation. This is the beginning of about nine uh, master classes I'm going to do in the course of the semester. I'm starting out with a lot of blah, 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 but I'm also hoping that we're going to do playing along the way. This is not all going to be about um, you having to listen to me talk. Although I'm, I'm sharing with you, first of all, well, let me go back to the curriculum. There's so many things I want to tell you and, and not enough time. Uh, the idea is the first three classes are on, on breathing, support, meaning how to make a sound, and then applying that to articulation. The next classes will be on the vocal idea, listening to the voice, learning from the voice, and then that will get more into the concepts of uh, resonance, how to what to do with these skills that we've been working on, how to make a good sound, etc., then um, after that, we're going to talk about how to work on music you've played too many times, which is virtually every excerpt that you've worked on in your life, uh, if you're anything like me, but I know it's the same for you. Now it's how to break down music and learn it properly. And then finally, playing auditions. So it, there's, a, there's an arc to these classes. Um, and in terms of the silver lining to a difficult period, which uh, my colleague Mark talked about, is that um, these classes probably wouldn't have happened, except in this circumstance, and probably not attended by so many people, unless it was done during orchestra, but during regular times, although there should be time for this, the time is needed to rehearse. You know, the time is then needed to be all playing together, which is so essential. And so then, well, when are we going to do these classes? So in other words, this time does, I thought, brings the opportunity to, for me to share with you what I've learned over, I've been playing a bassoon about 55 years, but let's say 50 years seriously anyway. And uh, I had the good fortune, once I found my way, like I said, through a remarkable set of circumstances, uh, 
to a man named Stephen Maxim, who was the first bassoon of the, near, of the Metropolitan Opera from before World War II into the mid-70s. Um, he was a great artist. He was an unbelievable teacher. And meeting up with him literally changed the course of my life, so I'm not going to give you that story. But he, he played at the Metropolitan, um, and he developed a concepts essentially by studying the greatest singers in the 20th century, certainly up to the last 25 years, you know, minus the last 25 years. But he talked to them, he listened to them, he observed them. Uh, and this is how he developed a lot of his own concepts. And I've spent my teaching career doing my best to pass on what he taught me. I might have added a few things myself, but I can tell you, my students are always going to be My teacher used to say, Mr. Maxim said, and it's just easier to give him credit for everything because that's fine with me because <laughs> I owe him that much. Now, the other thing I'll say is I'm a bassoonist. I've, I've been around, I've been teaching a long time, I know the concepts I'm going to talk about, even when you get to articulation, for instance, much of it is in common, uh, but each of you has an excellent teacher. If I tell you something that goes against what your teacher is telling you, go with your teacher. That's fine. There are just different ways to think about it, describe it, and to some extent do things. And so it is not my interest in messing with your progress with your own teacher. Also, I can talk about embouchure, but for the flute, embouchure is different than on a bassoon or whatever it is. So you've a flute player or a trumpet player here, or even a violinist has to take what I might say. And I've heard violin players describe many of these things the same, I mean, related to the, their instrument, but really a lot of the same stuff. So you then uh, have to take what I'm saying and put it through the filter of your instrument. So I'm not here to say I know how to play the oboe, I know how to play the trumpet. I don't. I don't. I'm a bassoon player, and I, it's enough problems <laughs> just remaining a good bassoon player. All right, so I think we're about ready to roll. So. It all starts with breathing. There was a horn player in the Philharmonic years ago who said, once it gets to your chops, it's too late. That was his very sage-like way of pointing out it's how you set up the sound <laughs> that's going to make it happen or not. Okay, so the first slide you're going to see, or the next slide, is... Um, a really cool description of the diaphragm. We only can breathe because our diaphragm moves up and down. And we'll get more into it, but this is so well described, it's better than me yammering about it in my own kind of amateurish way. The primary muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a thin, dome-shaped layer of muscle and tendon that separates the abdominal cavity from the chest cavity. It gains its shape from its attachments and from the organs that surround it, especially the heart, lungs, and liver. The diaphragm attaches at the costals along the lower rib cage, high in the front of the sternum, and deeply in the back lung spine. The diaphragm also attaches to itself via a central tendon making the diaphragm one of the unique muscles of the body. The diaphragm uses its central tendon and its attachments as leverage to flatten during inhalation. The expansion of the ribs comes from the resistance of the internal organs to downward movement. As the internal organs are slow to move, the ribs expand to make room for the lungs. While the diaphragm attaches at the bottom of the ribs, its range of motion never reaches that low in the body. As seen from below, we get a sense of the full range of motion of the diaphragm as it would glide over the aorta, the vena cava, the esophagus, and the internal organs. For more information, visit www.3dyoga.com. So you notice it says 3D yoga, it says yoga, uh, with this kind of deep breathing concept, the idea of using your body, everything we do on the instruments or singing, right, anything we do, in life, it's best done in the most natural way, right? The more you go against 
na the natural approach, the, the way your body would like to function, the way it's engineered, the more problems you get into, both in terms of efficiency and, heaven forbid, injury, right? So uh, it starts, we're talking first about, say, efficiency and using things properly to um, sound better on our instrument, but it's also even a health issue in terms of being careful in other ways, not so much with breathing, but in other ways of not hurting ourselves. Uh, okay, so you see that whole, the diaphragm, the diaphragm moving. I'm sure you've heard about that, breathe into your diaphragm, all of that. The point of that is you see that diaphragm muscle move. When that diaphragm muscle moves, it moves your organs. He refers to that. He says, the ribs begin to expand because as the diaphragm hits you, your stomach and liver or whatever it hits on the way down, it also opposes, uh, there's an opposing force which encourages your ribs to expand and to, I think they raise up even, you know, it just allows your lungs to expand better. So this whole idea of uh, that we're mostly of what talking about breathing, effic if inhaling efficiently is to allow your diaphragm to do its natural work. Now, so, the, I, uh, there are, this is now my teacher's teaching. And I realize I did not send along, but I will, uh, articles he wrote over 50, 60 years ago now on breathing uh, and, and support and all that. Uh, he wrote them for a magazine like back in the 1950s, Woodwind World or whatever. And, um, so this is taken right from my teacher's teaching, Stephen Maxim. So the idea is that when we breathe, you're sitting in a chair right now listening to me. Maybe some of you are lying down. Stay awake now. But uh, probably not standing. But if you're just breathing in a relaxed manner, or right now you're cycling just a little bit of air to keep, you know, uh, awake, <laughs> not to faint. And... Um, in doing so, you would notice really only your tummy moves a little bit, right? That doesn't mean air is going into your stomach. We know that. What it means is your diaphragm is moving a little bit, and so your lungs can cycle air. We don't even perceive much movement in our chest because the amount of air needed to just keep recycling and keep us sitting in a chair, lying down, is is minimal to keep the oxygen level and the carbon dioxide level the way it should be the way our body wants it so we only see larger movements either through physical activity aerobic kind of activity or in the case of wind players or anybody in, well wind players we're doing it more because we need to get a good amount of air in order to play a consistent long good sound for a period of time, and we'll get further into that. So, so if you think of the chest breath, is that breath, many of you have been told, probably everybody here, don't breathe into your chest, because when you do, you, it gets tight right away. You're told, breathe deeply, breathe into your abdomen, breathe into your diaphragm. What they're saying is, breathe into your torso, or relax, breathe into your torso, which allows your diaphragm to move, finish the exhalation in your chest. And I'm going to demonstrate that now. So because of the, uh, this I often would do lying on the floor, I would even bring a blanket or something in the, the first class and, you know, call it like breathing 101, you know, a remedial breathing for extra credit. It's good at the end of the semester, it could come in handy. So uh, uh, this is, me, uh, this was from the other day because I can't be running around and trying to do this uh, live. So this will explain a minute short uh, video. As I've already said, the idea of these next exercises is to start first lying down. And then we can also practice the same exercises standing up and sitting with or without the instrument, without our instruments. Uh, but to start from the lying position is best because it takes away as many distractions as possible. So by lying down, it's easiest to be able to identify different parts of our breath without having to be standing or sitting. We'd like to think of breathing as having two basic parts. We have the chest breath and the abdominal breath. 
The best way is always the natural way when we're playing, whether it's our fingers, our embouchure, our tongue, or our breathing, or the way we sit or stand. So what I'd like you to do is, when you're home, it's to lie down on the floor or, or on a bed. I'm using this sofa because it makes it easier to film. And first, just notice if you put one hand up on your chest and one down on your belly, if you only breathe a little lightly as you would in that situation through your mouth, you just feel, in this case, my right hand, the one on my tummy going up and down a little bit. Then you could follow that breath to make a bigger breath, but concentrating mostly on raising this hand first. So if I go, you notice this hand came up first and then my chest also expanded above. Um, that is the correct way to get a breath. And we do think of it as an abdominal breath and a chest breath. You'll notice if you take the abdominal breath first, it's easy to segue into the chest breath and get a really full capacity of air in your lungs. Doing it again, Now, if I went into my chest breath first and you're told, don't just raise your sh shoulders or breathe into your chest, you'll notice that goes up, but then it's very hard to move this, this hand, the right hand up. It's very hard to get the diaphragm to move further. When we breathe that way, we don't get a lot of oxygen, a lot of air into our lungs. And that is the reason why we want to uh, breathe this way. So we can get, we can become comfortable knowing about both breaths, the abdominal and the chest breath. The chest breath is often sort of like you were startled and you go, and it only goes up into your chest. And that's that kind of a breath. And of course, as I said already, we have the abdominal breath. So get used to both and then work on really expanding your belly and then going up into your chest as much as you can. And I'm sure you'll find that's much more air than you're used to getting. We'll learn a little bit later when we talk about support, how this proper breathing really sets us up better to get really in a good support position to make a good sound. As I've already said, Okay, so uh, that was the easiest way to do that. Um, the, uh, the, the fact is, as I've already alluded to, I would suggest you try that lying down. The point of problem solving, any problem you work on, just to go step out tangentially to a little more ph philosophy of teaching or self-teaching, when you start to work on a problem, Take the least challenging version of that. Start with the thing you feel most comfortable about or the thing you feel you actually know how to do. Like if you lie down on, on a bed and just listening to music, you are very likely to breathe correctly. You're very likely to only move your belly a little bit to, to go right into what Mother Nature intended for you. And so that's why lying down is a good way to do it. Not trying to learn that while you're holding a bassoon or a flute or a fiddle, anything. So then I would suggest you stand up and try it. Try the same um, without your instrument, just standing comfortably. Then try it seated if the way you're going to perform. Try it seated. Then you can pick up your instrument and try it. I had a student years and years ago <laughs> who was very tall, and we're going to get into this issue actually next, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hold that for, for one second, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. So I, I urge you to try that all three ways. And to the extent that these days, for instance, you know, in teaching, uh, as I've said to some of my own students, when I was a student, hands-on was acceptable, whether it should have been or not, my teacher would be prodding me and pushing me and that, and then it was always meant in the, you know, the very tasteful and clean way. There was nothing about that that was untoward. But I could understand, and I embraced the whole idea that 
These days we respect people's space and, and person, and that's fine with me. So as teachers, you have to come up, and I've had to come up with new ways to explain stuff that I might have shown more physically, literally physically. And so um, this is a way, for instance, to work on, on this kind of breathing thing, and, and, and really a, each individual can work on it separately. And I mean, my teacher was teaching that back in the day when that, the, the, the hands-on thing was not an issue uh, yet. And um, so that technique goes back beyond that, but before that. But it is, it's good to be developing these kinds of concepts to, to teach. I mean, that's our obligation to evolve with the demands of teaching as time goes on. Now, one thing you can do uh, you can do it even sitting down. There's feeling expansion in your lower back. When you get a breath, you want that breath. You're going to feel it mostly, as I said already, more in your, you know, in your belly and your chest. But if you want to, if you notice, if you just lean forward in your chairs now or stood up and did it, if you lean over and then put your hands on your back, you know, the small of your back, let's say on your waistline, just above your belt line, and you take a breath in, you'll start to feel a little bit, it's a little harder to do sitting down, but you'll feel a little bit of motion in your lower back, a little bit of expansion. Think of breathing in that way, it's very important because that'll also come in handy for support as well. Okay, so in other words, we're setting up in a natural way, using that word foundation, fundamental, we're building up from the bottom up, we're building solid bricks and building up. Another, here's another thing. How many people, well, of course, it's harder to, to get people to raise their hands at this point, but uh, how many people have felt they were trying to make a good breath, but it was time to play in a sort of maybe pressure-filled situation. They couldn't get a good breath. Oh, oh, me, me, me. I'm sure many other people. Now, here's, here's a couple of reasons why. I want you to try this. Um, first, I want you to just take a nice relaxed breath, you know, just with your mouth open, just go, just that, like you're sighing because will this guy ever stop talking? And then after you do that, now what I want you to do is flex your abdominal muscles, make them tight, you know, like maybe a brother or sister or someone was going to poke you in, in the belly, in a, not in a malicious way, right? Tighten up your belly. Now take a breath, right? It's like, you can't get a good breath, true, right? You cannot get a good breath. Um, now here's one that's, that's pretty obvious. If you tense your stomach muscles, your stomach is not going to expand, your diaphragm's not gonna be able to move, right? That makes sense. That's pretty obvious, one would say. But here's a good one. I want you to clench both your, both your fists, like you're super angry, not just that you're going to pop somebody, you're really angry, now take a breath. You notice the difference, right? You notice the difference. It's not as easy to get a breath. So that tells you that, a, you know, pretty maybe your toes would be further away from your lungs than your hands, but it's harder to clench your toes. At least for me it is. Your hands are this far away, three feet from your lungs, or, you know, two and a half feet. You clench those, must, those hands and breathing is affected. Tension affects your breathing. So here you are getting ready to play. You're tense and then you feel like I can't get a good breath, right? So the easier said than done, but what you have to be able to do is say relax, breathe, set, play, right? And we'll work more about that. Posture is another good example. Sometimes we sit and we want to sit up and proper. I want you all actually just sitting comfortably right now just to review how a breath feels because you haven't done one in at least 10 seconds or five seconds or so, is take a breath and feel the comfortable, just a comfortable breath, right? Now sit up super straight, curve your back, you know, like you're really sitting up in a chair, curve your back, now take a breath. You get stuck almost immediately like you did when your tummy was tight, right? When your tum uh, tummy muscles were being flexed. Now, just imagine if you're flexing your stomach and sitting up like that at the same time. I'm going to play this, man. Here I go. And then <clears throat> no breathing, right? You, it was like you were, again, talking about like as kids and we would um, wrestle, you know, tussling with your brother or whatever it is, sister. 
grab you around the, the, you know, around the chest, around the belly, and you say, let me go, I can't breathe, right? You know, it's like you've kept someone from getting a good breath. So posture, uh, the, the bottom two have more to do, say, with tension and, uh, you know, about getting a good breath. That way, the first one was more of a description of how to get a good breath. All these things could be taught to fourth graders if they're willing to listen. But um, that's the point. This is basic stuff for everyone. And I teach this to my students from 18 to 28 in terms of age, let's say, just to... So um, it's not meant as rudimentary. All right, so now we get on to uh, breathing exhalation. Excellent job of mastering insulation by, inhalation, by the way, class. You did a great job. You, you're breathing like, like crazy. Now, exhalation. If you, think, if you think of the clock face, if you think of breathing as a clock face, and uh, one moment, please, uh, you, as a clock face, and we think that we breathe in, from 6 to 12, we breathe out from 12 to 6, right? The cycle of air, in and out. Now, I want you, if you take a breath and just let it go, I want you to fill up and then just let it go. What happens? Everyone try it. I mean, you know what happens, but go. <sighs> the air comes out in a decrescendo, correct? You might say. You cannot, and I am an expert at the bassoon, I might say, 55 years of experience. If you play the bassoon that way. So I have learned in my 55 years, that is not the most admirable sound or production that I'm hoping for. And when you teach little kids, that's how they start, right? Thou, like that. So what are we saying? If you breathe in from 6 to 12 and just let it go, you will exhale the fact that your body is expanded, the fact that there's both expansion involved, of course, the diaphragm, which is going to do its job in moving back up to uh, expel the air from your lungs, because that's what moves down to create essentially a vacuum when the air goes in. Like you suck in the air. Like I said, he's really sucking air today out on the ball field. You are literally sucking air. And then you, the diaphragm moves back up again and the air goes out but it just goes out. So what we need to do, and remember this clock face, because we're going to talk about that later in terms of how to enter a note, how to enter a note, the timing of entering a note. So the clock face uh, will, will come back to haunt us. Oh, I forgot to tell you the story. I had this student who, with the arched back, remember I was showing you how it was hard. He, he was very tall. Happened to be an African-American kid like a basketball player size, like a guy that can hold a basketball like this, you know, which I can, I have a big hand, but I cannot do that. And in fact, we had to get special uh, stuff for his instrument because the hands were too big for a bassoon. And that's usually not a problem, but he was a big guy and he tended to stand because he was this tall guy. He tend, he would stand very erect, very good posture, but sometimes it affected his breathing. So if you would have walked in, this was at Juilliard, you would have walked into the studio we were both lying on our backs on the floor with instruments, trying to locate a good position. You know, another way you can do it, however, is if you use the edge of a door or the corner of a wall. But if you open a door, which is better than lying on the floor, because then you don't have, uh, there won't be anything in the way of your shoulders, you know, trying, I mean, your elbows, trying to hold a bassoon lying on the floor is not quite the best thing. But um, if you use a doorway, I mean, a, a door, open door, you could sort of line yourself up against the door and have, you know, your arms will be on either side of the door, you would say, and you could work on your posture. Okay, but what we need to do is to create, these parallel lines are to indicate a consistent airstream, as it says. And, you know, when we took that breath and then just let it go, that's basically initial air <sighs> right the amount of air that you're going to let out under normal circumstances and we don't let out all the air in our bodies i mean we we don't ever but we we exhale the comfortable amount 
Like I said, if you're lying in bed or even now listening to me, the comfortable amount of air to recycle, in other words, to let out before you breathe in is not that much. You're not trying to sustain an, a stream of air. You're just breathing. So you could say in a way, just like that chest, this is more in a way, some of this stuff would not be proven in a court of law, but go with me in terms of concept. This is almost like the chest breath in a way, the initial air. And then that reserve tank, you might argue, is like the lower air in your lungs. Because if you're pushing the air out from the bottom, the top stuff's going to go out first, right? So, and again, that's a very, very basic and could certainly, if there was a doctor in a room, be refuted, probably lickety split. But it'll work for our purposes. We want a consistent, instead of sounding like I did when I picked up my bassoon, we want a consistent stream of air so that we can create a consistent tone on our instruments. Right? Um, that's pretty obvious. So this picture, which comes again from my dear teacher, or this, not this particular one, but this concept, uh, I think is a good way to describe the concept of you need to keep the air going. <clears throat> now the next slide, yeah, the next one is far out. This is Sarah Willis, horn player from the Berlin Phil, and it's an MRI of her playing the instrument. Um, I think, actually, I forgot to set up I think I forgot, oh no, here, now it's doing it right. I think this will go from where I want it to. Watch how this is going to, you're going to see her torso, her thorax, the, her body, when she plays the instrument uh, through an MRI. Here it comes. <laughs> Now, I want to show you something there. Uh, you see the obvious, how to, this is just another way of representing how we saw the diaphragm working before. But I want you to see something really cool. I actually just noticed now is how what she does right before she plays the note. You'll see on this one coming up. Oh, she didn't play yet. Did you see that thing was in motion? She was setting her support which is going to be the next thing, before the note. You didn't see, ba, you saw, ba, right? That will go along with the idea of breathing till 12, support till 1 or 2, and then play in terms of the clock face, right? The, this is, uh, I love that. I didn't notice that before. <laughs> but that's... <laughs> Here it comes. She sets, then she plays. So I take it this is her front, this is her back. So we use these muscles to impact upon the diaphragm. It's doing its job, but she's working her back muscles, or actually 360 degrees of muscle, but a lot of it you feel is your lower back, which we're going to get into, and stomach. So that to me is such a graphic, as was that nice uh, video we saw first of the importance of the diaphragm. Without having proper control of this, you can't play properly. It's just a fact. You just can't. You can get away with it, but you have to consider it. All right. Oh, I know. I'm doing the wrong one. Idiot. There we go. Now, on to the next how to find, use the use of support to meet the instrument. Now, the, the use of support to meet the instrument is that meaning every note on our instrument has a resistance. So you saw the way she set her diaphragm just a little bit before she plays. She knows that was the spot she had to start at the, to create the intensity of air column that would allow that note to speak. That is exactly what we do on each of our wind instruments, regardless of brass, woodwind, double reed, flute, 
Uh, and I'm sure it's the same in the violin. I've known exactly what level of, of pressure, what kind of contact to draw the bow to get a pure sound the way you want it, let alone, you know, fingering for intonation and all that. Again, I'm not a string player, but that does make sense. And I know, uh, and my teacher, who also had been a, a, a string player in high school uh, way back when, um, he grew up on the Lower East Side when Stuyvesant High School was on the East Side instead of on the West Side. And uh, in the 19, like, 20s or something like that, this would have been. But um, it's the violin. Often, we, we even in wind playing, we talk about the concept of the bow. So these concepts do cross-pollinate in both directions. So I have a little video for you about this concept of why we want to be able to meet the, res the re um, resistance of each note. Where is my cursor? There it is. Uh, I guess it'd be better if I turn it on, just saying, right? Just theoretically. A good way to explain to a student, or even for your own concept, of what it means to meet the resistance of the note, to be at the threshold of the resistance of any given note on the instrument, you can use uh, some heavier object, like a piano. Now, if I come up to this piano and I'm not worrying about be, being, not being careful about being in place to move that piano by being uh, at its resistance point, you might say, at which point it will move. If I come up to it not knowing, I might say, okay, I want to move the piano, just come from a distance and go like this. And maybe it moves a little bit, maybe it doesn't. It would certainly be hard for me to move it gently, or you might say like, entering a note, right, if I go like this. If I really want to just move that piano a little bit, or if I really wanted to shove it, the best way to do it would be to lean against the piano, find its position of resistance, at which point I know if I go a little past this resistance, I can move the piano. I'm not going to shove it harder than that. I can move it very subtly, even though it's a heavy object, I can move it just a tiny bit, or as I said, I could push it with more, with more uh, gusto. So this is the same thing. When we go from note to note, and remember the handshake, we talk about moving from one note to the next, one note to the next, and we're always moving to voice the note to meet its threshold, to be at the threshold of what type of support we need to accomplish in order to enter that note successfully. Frank, can I just say I fully expected you to lift that piano? I'm just saying. <laughs> I saved that for the circus act later. It's, it's an amazing feat of strength. Hey, can, Actually, I, uh, can I say something quick? I'm just listening. You know, that's funny that I never realized my teacher, Fred Hinger, who you might have known. Oh, I knew, yeah, I knew Mr. Hinger. He was the timpanist of the Met, and he would oh, he would have you go up against a wall and push. The same idea, just so just coincidentally. Oh, thanks. That, that no, I'm glad. Happen. Please chime in. I love it, and that's the point. These, it's amazing how we can, through our filter of our instruments and our experience, take very these concepts, and and so often they they are used to describe. Uh, other, you know, other forms, other media within our, you know, you know, our field. Does anyone, by the way, does anyone have a question up to this point? And if you do, it might be better to just voice it uh, instead of us worrying about raising hands or something. No? Okay. I know I'm, I am that good. How could you possibly have a question after my incredible explanations? But you never know. Every now and then someone has a question. No, I'm happy. Along the way, if you have a question, in a quiet moment, please just chime in and we'll go for it, okay? Because that's one thing about this system that's a little more difficult is keeping track of if someone has a question. And I want very much to answer your questions. Now, one thing I did, uh, I had changed slightly the order of these uh, 
slides and presentations, I mentioned the handshake. And so it got preempted, but uh, we use preemptively and uh, mentioned, although it, it's not uh, irrelevant to the moment. But that is that, um, as I was already saying, we go from note to note. So the first thing we're going to be learning once we start learning about how to actually support, but I want to get these concepts in place so then when we get to the next part, you understand what we're talking about. We don't just support one note at a time. We don't go, wah, ha, ha. The point of support is that once you have met the resistance of the note you're on, you're already moving towards the next note. Whether that note is a whole note away or a sixteenth note away, whether that note is tongued or slurred, whether that note is separated by a rest, be, unless you're taking a breath, and often what I tell people, and we may get to that later, in this uh, set of three con uh, uh, classes, by the way, I'm hoping by later in the second class, and certainly the third class, we will build upon these concepts with people playing. That's the plan. So today, it's more about these doing exercises and things together, showing you some demonstrations into the next class, and then we will we can actually apply both for production, breathing, support, and articulation, uh, these concepts. But, uh, all right, so that's where we're headed. So the idea of, you'll see about the handshake now, that, and this comes from the boss, my teacher, may he forever rest in peace, he, um, the idea, you don't support one note at a time, uh, just like that horn player said, once it gets to your chops, it's too late. You have to be, and we saw with Sarah Willis, she set for, she was doing one note, but had she been playing a line of notes, I, you would have seen that, that diaphragm setting to be ready. But the thing is, she's not controlling her diaphragm. She has to control it with external muscles, but we're getting there. So the concept of the handshake, and all my students, when I say to them, remember the handshake, I'm saying, be moving to the next note. Be moving to the, say, the note, actually I often think of all music in my own interpretation, that almost never is a downbeat a downbeat. Almost every downbeat you play is a pickup to something else. Almost always a downbeat is a pickup to something else. It works great, things like Schumann romances, which are which I play on the bassoon and it's of course much better than on the oboe, but we won't go into political, we won't get too political or religious today, it's dangerous to do that in an academic situation. But it's not da da di di da di da di da. It's di da da di da 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 di da. Or bolero's not ba da 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 da. It's di da 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 di di da da di da da. So the 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 most important B flat, the really downbeat B flat, you might say, is the last one you play in that line at the beginning for bassoon. So. Um, you're always moving. And so here, with the help of Mrs. Morelli, you don't see her on camera because that would have cost me way too much money, you know, union rules and all that. Uh, you'll see the handshake because you've never seen a handshake, so it's very important for you to... A handshake is a good way to have a concept of always moving your support. We don't play notes this way, ba, da, da, and just move to the next note in a jolt. Now, this time, Mrs. Morelli is going to put a little weight behind, a uh, little resistance behind her hand. So when I start to sing these, this row of notes, ba, da, di, da, da, and into the rest, I never stopped supporting or moving my support from one note to the next. A handshake is a good oh, way... Oh, be quiet, Morelli. That's enough out of you. So, that's what we're talking about. We started by getting a good breath. How to get a good full breath. Now, the concept of the importance of support as it relates, one, to entering notes, the resistance of the note. Every the reason when you and even the definition of a good or bad read, if you're playing a low note on the bassoon 
and you're having trouble with that note coming out, it could be in your production. I mean, we're not looking for excuses, but if that read is not set to accept, to, to, to respond at what is a reasonable level of support on my part to meet the resistance of the note on the instrument, then I have a problem. So that could be a read problem. It certainly can be a uh, technical problem, my own mechanics could be improved. So again, I'm not saying looking for, oh, it's always the read. That was dangerous with my own teacher. These days we don't like plan each other's reads as much. He would pick up my instrument with my read on it and then do for me what I had just told him the read was the problem. And then he'd say, all right, what's your next excuse? <laughs> and now we, we ruled out that excuse. Let's get on. And in fact, uh, there's a wonderful recording of one of my younger colleagues, uh, Sue Heinemann, first bassoon in the National Symphony, who studied with Mr. Maxim. And one day she came in complaining about her read, and he said he was older then. He'd say, and he talked to females and said, my dear, that's the cross you have to bear. And then instead of fixing the read, they started working on support and all that and getting the sound together. And about five minutes later, he said to her, boy, that reads playing a lot better now, isn't it? You know, <laughs> so, I mean, the fact is you do have to have equipment that works for you, but this is also a way to understand your mechanics to overcome the situation. Because I believe me, I haven't spent my life playing on great reads every day. And you know what? No excuse. First of all, if I don't have a great read, it's my own fault. Secondly, if I don't have a great read, no one cares do your job. No, you know, I mean, that's just how it is for all of us. Okay, so identifying support muscles. Now we're on to this slide and exercise number one for everyone to do. Many of the students are familiar with this, certainly the rep class people and my own students, is in order to identify, remember the parallel lines and with the initial and residual air. And the idea that we must now make a consistent airstream. We must make a consistent airstream. So let's identify with an exercise. And this is a great exercise for all ages. And when you do a master class, for instance, like we're doing this now, uh, if, without patting myself a little on the back, I am, of course, this class is more, if, say I was working with one student and talking about this stuff. The next thing I would do would be to turn to the entire audience and say, let's all do this exercise. In other words, when you're teaching, whether it's a class, uh, a, a master class, the more you could uh, integrate what you're, incorporate the entire uh, number of the audience, the entire number of people listening into what you're working on, the better. So I bring that up to you just as words of advice about how to do baffo material. See, I'm a stand-up comedian at heart, so master classes are right up my alley. That's my wife always says, those poor people, you have this, you know, captive audience and they have to, my students have to laugh at my jokes. You know, it sort of comes with the job description. But anyway, number one, identifying those muscles. So what I want you to do now, everyone to do this, I want you to exhale a normal, I'll, I'll show you to do it once, how to do it. I want you to exhale a normal breath. And this comes from the boss, this one too. Exhale a normal breath. Do it down to the bottom of a comfortable ending. But when you get to the bottom of what would be a usual exhale for you, there is considerably more air left in your lungs. What I want you to do while you're at the bottom of that first breath is blow out a second blast of air like you were blowing out candles on a cake or blowing up a balloon vigorously like this. Now you're going to go, I'll try not to spit on my screen. So you go, you go, And when you do that second blast, I want you to tell me, maybe someone can chime in, where they felt the impetus, where they were pushing that second blast from in their bodies. So everybody, let's give it a try. Exhale, normal breath. Blow hard. All right. Who would like to answer the question? Someone just chime in, one of the students. I'm feeling it in my uh, abdominal muscles. Right, okay, you're feeling it in your abdominal muscles. Correct, do you feel anywhere else? Is that Devin? Who's talking? Oh, no, Christopher, I see now, right. Christopher, try it one more time. See if you notice it anywhere else. Do it just now by yourself, it's fine. I, 
I feel a little bit more right where my um, sort of my chest kind of meets my stomach. Yeah, Byron just said ribs, like right around my ribs, I guess. A little okay, that's okay. But the other place that if you'll do it again, I want everyone to do it again, is your lower back. Remember, I was talking about the expansion of your lower back when we were breathing in. But I have found much of the time that students I've had from, you know, of, of all ages and from different institutions with excellent teachers, and I'm sure probably the teachers did talk about this stuff. But the thing that most people ignore is the lower back, the lower back. To get a zingy sound on the instrument, to get the sound to really go, you need to use your lower back muscles. If you remember the horn player, did you see how her body went back together like that? Torso and, you know, both side, both front and back of her torso. And I'm sure a little bit from the sides too, but we were seeing that side slice, right? Like that. So, um, Dev, uh, Christopher, try one more time and think about your lower back. See if it, if it made a difference. We're waiting for you to answer. I don't yes. know. If you... Sorry, I just did it again. I definitely feel it more so, uh, kind of almost behind my my abdomen. My abdomen. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like does it feel a little bit like your back was pushing towards your abdomen a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Because remember, all of the the organs have been displaced somewhat. We the diaphragm, which I did not say, is basically an involuntary muscle the thing that controls i mean we can say breathe in now and so the diaphragm will move breathe out now but we can't really affect how it works like the muscle itself you could just tell it to go and if you're not paying attention it perceives your brain you know the monitor in your brain Whose brain, you know, the blood level monitor in the brain says, time to breathe. So you breathe, right? So, uh, th so that's why it's involuntary in that regard, both in terms of doing it, that it is obviously to stay alive when you're asleep. Luckily, your brain doesn't go on vacation as far as uh, lung <laughs> breathing goes. And um, so the way we affect how the diaphragm moves to create the proper support is with the muscles of the torso of the thorax and basically 360 degrees of muscle from the abdomen all the way around be careful if you get too much up here because just like just like if i'm talking this way and using lower muscles as soon as i start to go up here you hear it in my voice you'll hear it on your instrument if anyone's answer might have been or if you find someone who says I felt it from here, like a wheeze. That is not the way to support properly. And then, you know, you have to have them, you have to work very hard to get them to lean into their belly. We'll talk about that next. So rely on the flexing of the abdominal muscles, the use of the lower back muscles, so that it goes, in the essence, like the um, piston on an engine works, you don't want to push the air out of your lungs by pushing, pushing down and then up. The efficient way is, you might say, the diaphragm, as you see the way it works, it works like a piston, right? It pulls in just like a piston works. When a diaphragm goes down, it pulls the gas into the piston. For those of you who know how an engine works, not that I know much about it, but I know it pulls the air in. Then it compresses the, the, um, the, um, Spark plug goes off, boom, pushes it back out again. But um, the efficient way to expel the air is from the bottom up. And that's, that's something to remember. Uh, expel the air, in this case, with a constant sense of, of uh, support, of intensity in the, in the airstream. All right. Now, a way to feel how much you should, because the danger is you could either underdo something, and you definitely could overdo something. And th that's important in support, not to overdo it. Like too much tension, like that, in, in thinking, I'm going to use my muscles now and actually go too far. So a very simple way is this. Number two, this is uh, rather easy to accomplish. If you imagine you're sitting in a chair and you have to lean over to pick up, well, if you're a timpani player sitting in a chair and you have to 
lean over to pick up the stick you just dropped, or if you're picking up a pencil off the floor, everyone try to, if you lean over slightly, you notice how your abdom, the abdominal muscles tense up a little bit, right? They flex. It's not, it's, but there is a, a um, they set, the muscles set. Because in this case, the muscles are being used to keep you from falling over because your spine is, is, is flexible. But the feeling, the feeling of leaning on your gut, our teacher would say, lean into your abdomen, lean in a little bit, set those muscles. And the way Christopher said he felt, yeah, a little bit like my back was pushing towards my abdomen. So you're kind of leaning into your abdomen and using your lower back. Okay. The way to feel, and now we'll get around to what Mark had mentioned before, the way to feel the effort in your lower back is one of two ways. If we were in a room, I might have people, someone, or go around the room, holding their hands like that in front of them, like perhaps we're going to drape a blanket or something over your two hands. And then I would just push lightly down on their palms and say, resist that right? Or pick up the piano. <laughs> or like sitting here right now, put your hands under your desk if you're sitting at a desk and just pick up on that desk slightly and you're going to notice your lower back, among other things, but your lower back sets a little bit. That's part of the feeling of your lower back in terms of support, right? That's the feeling. Obviously, you feel that in your biceps. You probably feel it up in, in your, your chest, you know, but those muscles are not related to what we're talking about. Uh, now, how many people, we said, we said this earlier, how many people have been told, don't raise your shoulders while you play? Me, 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 me. Only a thousand times. Well, probably more than that. But, uh, some, you know, give or take a thousand, a thousand times. Um, and I want to show you why. Now, a couple of reasons. One reason why it's not good to raise your shoulders, just like we talked about the natural approach. If you do that long enough, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to have tension. You're going to have pinch this and that and the other thing. So not a good idea. But what we're talking about today is this. Remember the exercise about exhale a breath and then blow out a second breath. I want you all raise your shoulders, right? Raise your shoulders, exhale the first breath, and then try to blow out the second breath. <sighs> what happens on the second blast? You cannot basically get to that second blast of air. So the same way I pointed out, if you breathe into your chest first, you can't really engage your diaphragm adequately. If you raise your shoulders and exhale, the same thing happens. You can't really access your diaphragm adequately. So when you see great singers, when they go to the high register, they don't go, ah, yeah, like that. they go down, they go into the floor. You can see them literally using... And I know Mr. Powell knows this also from his beautiful wife and wonderful artist, singer, that the idea that you don't, rate, you stay down, you use the earth. I always use the example of, um, you know, if someone says this, you stop, stop, it's weak, right? That's a weak kind of, we say sissy, right? A weak way of, of doing it. But if someone is down, if a guy my size is kind of hunched down and says, I would stop if I were you. I would get out of the way. Because now I'm using the floor. I'm using my core. I'm, I'm, I could put some punch behind that. If I just do this, I can slap, but I can't, I can't put a lot of power behind it. Don't raise your shoulders. And then the concept of the handshake, that you're doing all of this stuff and moving from note to note. So, which we already covered. Like I said, I slightly changed around the order of these two. I think it makes more sense. There are different ways of going about it and what to cover next. So, uh, we already did number five. Been there, done that. I even have the t-shirt for that one. All right. So, now we're down really to the last uh, part for today. And that is, and setting up next week. And that was the plan. So, I'm doing well uh, time-wise. And that is, each note has resistance. We've agreed to that. Where, how do you find it? And the way you find it on wind instruments is to first start it without using your tongue. Just using support. And it's good to do this with the tuner on to make sure you're in, doing it in tune. 
And we will go on, I forget what the next, how the next slide is set up. Right. And I'll say this for today, but we'll get into this next week. And that's what the point of this is. And this comes from the boss. We, I, a few years ago, I did actually a number out in California about five years ago, four or five years ago, for one of the International Double Read Society uh, conferences. I did a master class. My teacher used to say, and I got, I polled all my colleagues, all my old school buddies, and before me and since, uh, what were your favorite, his name was Maxim, Stephen Maxim, which was shortened from a uh, Ukrainian like Maximchu or something, but Maxim was his name. And um, he, uh, so, uh, you know, the term Maxim's a saying, right? So they were Maxim's Maxim's. And uh, one of the most favorite that people were writing to me to say, oh, Frank, don't forget 95% of uh, articulation is tone production. And the other one was support shrinks intervals, the handshake. If you support from note to note, notes that are seemingly far away are right next to each other. If you don't support and set the next note, they remain far away. Those were two favorites of himself. But to go back here, and this reed's been sitting here for a while, but hopefully something will come out of it. Let me just get my bassoon hooked up. Now, just like I said earlier, when you work on a technique, always start with the easiest way of doing it. The one that has the least amount of uh, um, other challenges. I mean, why do we practice things slowly? So we can think about the next fingering without being challenged by too much speed, right? In fact, we'll get into this next week. I'm always telling students when they're working on a technical passage that's tongued, first you have to practice it slurred. One reason being to make sure you can focus on your finger action without the distraction of tongue, uh, of synchronization, and also to make sure you're supporting it properly because if you meet the resistance of the next notes properly, they will be, they will articulate, they will respond better. Like Mr. Maxim said to Sue Heineman, boy, your reed's playing better now. And that was because she was playing better. But anyway, so I, I have on a bassoon, I would start on something like middle C or open, we call open F because when you play open F, all you're doing is hitting this whisper key, which co closes this little hole here. So it's almost like you're, you're playing on almost none of the instrument. So or, that's middle C or, you know, the middle C for us, it's our third C already, but for the piano, it's middle C. Now, so the idea is what I want you to do for next week is think about this concept. And what you want to do is see you don't want to practice. And I use now the term, I stopped using the term breath attack because breath attack can imply and little kids. <laughs> Right? That's little kids. So then you want them to tongue and they still go. Right? And then, oops, fine. I think that's Mr. Maxim here. Oh, I forgot something. He just, he just, Mr. Maxim just called me to let me know I forgot something in my uh, speech. But um, sorry about that. Now, what you want to do is, I now call it a support attack. I, or an untongued attack. I have stopped using breath attack. Because another thing as teachers, and like I said, this is about pedagogy, both for your own concepts and for those of, of, as, uh, as a teacher, is sometimes we give bad subliminal messages, totally unwittingly. Breath attack can have a bad subliminal message about how you go about it. <laughs> wheeze, 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 you know? And we don't, we want to, we want to, you're using your support to meet the resistance of the note, not your breath. Now they go together, I understand, but you have to be able to distinguish in your mind between support, the muscles we're using, and how much air is going through the instrument. Because if anything, I use more support when I'm playing more softly 
than when I'm playing louder. You could probably even hear, if I move the mic, can you hear the air sort of going through the instrument between the notes? Good. The reason for that is I'm trying to establish not how much air it takes to get through, how much support it takes. And by keeping the air going between the notes means I'm not stopping notes with my tongue or my throat or anywhere up or down the pike, right? And then once you practice that, and I learned this, one person I learned this from, I think, although I don't know if he did it untongued or not, I don't remember if I asked him, it's Professor Jolly, because I know him for a long time and been on the road with him. And Professor Jolly will practice like, you know, a high note on the horn, whatever, but like, over and over. Now I'm using my tongue. I'm sort of, and sometimes I would even tease him. I'd go, ooh, 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 you know, like joking with each other. But that's why he plays so great. He would focus. He still does. And I'm sure he has you students doing this in the brass family he, on finding exactly the entry point of that note. And if you want to be skilled on your instrument, you have to be an expert at that. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. And you'll never stop working on it. If you're like me, you'll never if you want to, I mean, assuming you want to still play well, you'll never stop working on it. So the idea is you're finding both the physical position where the note speaks. Now, if I don't get there, it's right. I'd be like I was supporting too low where the note started to speak, but it was flat. That's a whole nother thing about tone production we're not getting into today. I mean, there are many, many topics we could cover in this whole area. And the other thing, if you can see, I'm wearing this black shirt that I often see when people try this is they come at each note separately. That's what I was saying about the air leaking. They go like, like it's like huff and puff. What I'm saying is you lean, I'm leaning against the piano. I'm not backing off the piano. I'm leaning into the piano and then I'm seeing exactly how much effort it takes to move past that point of at the threshold of the note. And you have to know that you have to be an expert about that on every note on your instrument. If you want to really be a top player, there's no way around it. It's just a fact. And I don't care what kind of playing you do. It's always a good idea. If you want to have total control of your instrument and it takes just like working on intonation, which we're not even going to get into in this cycle of classes, but all of this leads all of this syllabus leads to all of these other areas of tone production of intonation. And why do we do all of this? It may be a lot of, you know, a little bit of analytical blah, 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 so that we can ultimately forget about it, transcend it and make music. That's, that's why we do this. It's not just to prove I can tongue fast or finger fast or go high, go low. It's about making music. But in order to make music on the level you would aspire to and that I aspire to, we all aspire to, you have to have this level of control of your instrument and knowledge of your instrument. So for this week, and you can try it on notes that are comical, trying without using your tongue. Low C on the bassoon or on the oboe might not be too pleasant to play without your tongue. But the point is you can super, it's almost like super ab crunches, find how much it would take to get that note to speak without the tongue if you can get it to. And sometimes if the reed is loose enough, you get lucky and one will come out. But that's not the point. The point is finding the threshold, not the note speaking perfectly on a low C, two octaves below the other note. And then if I did that for a while, I can then...
again, you hear the air going through in between. And when I would play, the most important part in the introduction to Traviata, the bassoon part. You hear, I didn't go. I made a line out of it. Traviata. But I'm joking, obviously, about the bassoon part. Well, actually, I do think it's the most important part, but that's another problem that I have. So, uh, but the idea is I'm doing that or I'm thinking that as one line as if I'm going That's not how you do it. So that's next week. Next week, we're going to talk, we're going to take these concepts and we're going to carry on into how to articulate, how to control articulation, how to learn to articulate, and even get into uh, working on speed. Won't get into double tongue. That does get different from instrument to instrument, <coughs> but um, light articulation. Uh, we're going to stop now, but does anyone have any questions first? Or observations from my dear colleagues. I'm happy to hear. <clears throat> no, just uh, it's amazing how many things are, um, you know, like are things that I talk about, even though the instruments are so different. But I guess that's that's not crazy in itself. But. Yeah, well, I remember you saying that because Keith Underwood is a real guru on this stuff. My my thing isn't quite as I think fancy as his. But, and he's great, he really knows his stuff. <clears throat> and he's a wonderful flute teacher and player mm -hmm. and pedagogue in the area of breathing. Uh, and I remember you said you heard a class of his and how much his students, your students were kind of getting out of it. Or yeah, you were... my percussion students actually sounded different, like on a, on a snare drum, just sounded different, like when they incorporated correct breathing yeah it was very yeah very and just the concept of vocal you know like you watch well like i made some recordings with gil kalish and he kind of sings you know so sometimes the engineer saying gil could you cut down because he's like eh, kind of sing along and richard good who we performed a lot with orpheus and recorded with and he would mouth he's like because he's trying to tell his fingers he's trying to create the same articulation, the same enunciation as a singer would onto the piano, which I find especially incredible because it's, as a wind player or a percussionist, I would think it's incredible because as a wind player, I feel this physical connection like I'm singing. You know, oh, yeah. the breathing, the reed is in my mouth. You know, there are things about, I'm even, changing my vocal, uh, my uh, mouth cavity to create sound the way singers do, you know, different timbres and pitches, a quality intonation. Right, right. When you guys are doing it on something outside your body, in my opinion, you know, from my perspective, I find it especially uh, awesome to create, like when yeah. you hear a pianist create a liquid line, you know, and you think, God, that sounds like they were just like almost glissing from note to note on a violin. And it's a yeah. piano. And how do you do that? Well, you practice your butt off. That's how you do that. And you also have incredible art artistic intellect. So I think we'll stop there. If there are any questions. Then I'm, I think... here, I'm here at school, everybody. So waiting oh. to see people walk in. So ha have a good day and the rest of your classes. And uh, that mm -hmm. was great. Thanks, Mark. And many, Jeff. many thanks. This was a terrific presentation. There will be uh, multiple ways to get to the recording of this presentation as well. You'll be able to get it via uh, a YouTube link on the Copeland School website. So use it as the resource it is. It, it makes a phenomenal reference book once it is up on the, ta up on the channel. And I'll see my wind class this afternoon, so we could we could continue with 
these concepts, which you hear, you've had, have heard from me on and off over this last couple of semesters. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you all being here. And uh, if you have any questions, you could always reach me. All right. <laughs>